Um, our next speaker tonight is Alistair Hamill. Alistair is a teacher at Lurgan College, where he is a senior leader and head of geography. He also leads the teaching and learning committee in the Craig Avon area learning community. Tonight, Alistair is going to talk about retrieval practice and we'll show how he models and demonstrates this with his pupils. Alistair, are you there? Yes, David, can you hear me okay? Yes, I'll leave it with you then. Great, thanks very much. So thanks, David, and to the team in BBC uh, Northern Ireland for, for making this happen. It's good to be along with you again uh, this year. So the, the overall theme of today really is taking a look at some of the wider system and um, priorities and changes that are going on. So thanks to Noel for setting that big picture of some of those priority documents. I'm going to be bringing us uh, from the looking at from the other point of view, from the perspective of the classroom here, but informing what's going on at the moment are documents like uh, learning leaders, which puts teachers right at the heart of the professional development that's going on. Also, uh, some of the things that have emerged from how teachers were working and sharing together during COVID, uh, EA is op operating uh, TPL Thursdays, which is open to teachers from across Northern Ireland to come along and do something very similar to, to what I'm doing tonight, is basically just to share a little bit of their practice. Some of the grassroots or, um, organizations and events that are happening, like Research Ed Dublin, some of you may have been there a few weeks ago. And even within our own ALC and Craig Avon, we're setting up a, or have set up an Edu Hub where we're trying to have these TPL pathways for teachers in Craig Avon for us to focus uh, and work together. So all of that to say that we are in a context now where there is tremendous grassroots sharing. There's an opportunity for teachers to be really focusing on the core business of what we do in terms of teaching and learning within the classroom. So what I want to do tonight is to share with you about one aspect of that. Um, and uh, I know this is BBC and we need to have good BBC balance here. I'm afraid that I don't speak any Irish. So if there's any Irish speakers there that would like to translate that Ulster Scots better felt and telt into Irish, please do feel free to drop that into the chat. Uh, if you're wondering why that's there, all will be revealed a little bit later on. So uh, we're going to just simply structure this in the why, the what, and the how. So let's start with why we need to think about retrieval practice. And we start with considering a definition of what learning might be. Now, this isn't by any stretch of the imagination the totality of how we would define learning, but nevertheless, I, I think it tells us something interesting um, because this is all about trying to produce some kind of change in the long-term memory or to turn that into a slightly more graphic illustration. How do we make learning sticky? Now, those of you that were down at Research Ed um, in Dublin a couple of weekends ago were treated to the most amazing presentation by Barbara Oakley. If you haven't heard her speak, I've put the link in here for her YouTube presentation. It is an absolute tour de force through some of the recent developments and understandings in neuroscience about what learning uh, involves. So I'm not going to even try to replicate what she did because I would fail greatly. But if you're wondering what all of these are, do have a look at her video and check it out. But basically the idea is that um, learning involves physical changes in our brain. And she showed these images of some of the neurons in our brain. This is before learning and before sleep. There's a very interesting angle in all of that and how we do learning. But she showed this and then the change that can take place after learning and after sleep. We see those physical changes that are taking place in our brain as our brain tries to assimilate new information that we're learning and hearing at the moment. The problem with that, of course, is that that learning tends to fade off. This is Hebenhaus's curve, very, very famous. We don't need him to tell us that over time, our memory begins to fade and it becomes harder and harder to recall what we had heard before. So there's two aspects of this that are worth considering in terms of how do we make sticky learning. There's retrieval strength, how easy it is to access our memories and storage strength, how robustly they are stored. So I've got some digital post-its to the left. I wonder where you might stick those on that matrix. So an unfamiliar phone number that you've just dialed, and of course that's gonna go down there to both limited retrieval and storage strength. The only way that we can remember unfamiliar phone numbers really is to practice them over, go over and over and over them in our mind. And as soon as that's broken, they're gone. What about your last car's number plate? Where would you put this? Well, perhaps here, not your current number plate, maybe your past one or a few ago, it might take a little bit of a hint 
for that to come back to you. Um, so you mightn't have great retrieval strength, but maybe with a little bit of a clue that would come back. Your bank card pin number. Well, and I suppose in these days of contactless, when we're not putting the pins in quite so frequently, that might be a little bit harder. But previously, that was a number that you would have very good storage strength. It's absolutely there and very good retrieval strength. You can type that in whenever you're at the cashier point. And what about this one? The time of today's dentist appointment? Well, that's going to be pretty high up in your retrieval strength. You're going to remember, I need to be there for half past three today. But in two or three weeks time, you'll not remember that at all. The story strength isn't too strong. Now, why does all of this matter? I'm going to quote quite a bit from this book tonight. Uh, it's well worth checking out if you want to read further. Um, but Arm Armadier Beer says this. Um, this is why it can appear as if students have got it when they answer questions during the new learning. The recency of the learning and the large amount of cues available mean retrieval strength is high. It also explains why students can appear to have lost it only a few days later. New learning has low story strength. Forgetting is inevitable and the students haven't had an opportunity to practice. So the retrieval strength has declined rapidly. The change in knowledge was temporary, not permanent. So he refers to in his book uh, this particular study that tested this out by giving um, some students a um, piece of work for them to study and try and recall at a later stage whenever they were tested on it. So they were split into three groups. One group was allowed to study the uh, text four separate times. So they had access to the original text. They were able to read that four times. The other group were able to read it three times and then test themselves before the official test. And the third group was allowed to read it only once and then was given three opportunities to try to self-test, to retrieve the information that was there. Um, so five minutes after that happened, those that had read over it um, were having greater retrieval strength. But I wonder what the graph looks like three or two weeks later. This is what the research showed. If the students were only reading, even though they were reading it four times, the retrieval rate went down very, very significantly. And look at this one. The students who only read it once and tested themselves on it three times were remembering significantly more than the students who read the original text four times. It's really quite significant, I think. So those are some of the reasons why I think we need to consider retrieval practice because learning, we want it to be sticky. We do tend to forget. And this, ten this tendency towards our use of retrieval practice can help us um, to retrieve and um, improve our memory recall. But what is this retrieval practice that we're talking about? Well, it's, I would define it as a series of strategies that we use to practice retrieving new information. And again, a little bit of neuroscience here. Did this with my visualizer earlier on in school. So those are the connections between our brains. And initially when those connections are made, it's kind of like whenever we sketch it in with a pencil, it's quite faint and it can easily be lost and rubbed out again. It's not necessarily particularly sticky. What retrieval does is requires you to go and get that information and therefore it begins to strengthen the connections in your brain. And the more you retrieve, the stronger those connections become. So that's the idea behind it. It is the act of retrieving, which is the act that reinforces those connections and reinforces the retrieval strength and story strength of our learning. The second thing to say about it is retrieval practice is not a test. Sometimes it's called self-testing. Um, I, I much prefer the term retrieval practice because it doesn't carry in with it a connotation of learning. This isn't a test for me to find out how the students are getting on. This is part of the learning process. So whenever I'm delivering this, it's very, very important that this is felt and perceived by the students as low stakes. Without fail, uh, every time I've asked a colleague what's the first thing a student does when they get a piece of work back with a score grade on it, the answer is look at the grade and compare with their friends. This is something we want to rigorously to avoid. If we place the emphasis on the results, we reinforce the idea that practice testing is an end point rather than a tool for learning. We may also lull students into a false sense of security. They may think that because they've scored highly that they have learned the material but forgetting is inevitable and without practice, that information will be forgotten. 
The third thing I'll say is that there must be effort all, effortful. This is something that requires thinking. <laughs> and uh, the process of retrieval knowledge is effortful. So the students in that study, the study test, test, test group were engaging in effortful practice each time by searching their long-term memory. They were reaping the benefits, therefore, of retrieval. It's a very active, effortful process. The students in the study, study, study group who were able to look at the original text four times were not engaging in this effortful practice because reading can be done passively. So they didn't reap the benefits. Must be effortful. Okay, I did want to touch a little bit on Noel's work. I knew that he would be speaking and I thought it might be useful for us to consider a little bit of one particular aspect of a first start document um, that is particularly relevant, I think, for many of us, and that's boys and retrieval. Uh, so Noel has already gone through all of this and these are some of the things that I noticed uh, in the report that really caught my eye, the things that I would want to be really addressing attention on. In terms of classroom pedagogy, what are the strategies that I can introduce into my classroom that's really going to help the boys? And Noel's already talked about the underperformance of boys and especially the underperformance in um, free school male boys in, in comparison, the gaps are really quite significant. Now, is that because boys aren't as intelligent as girls? No, well, I'm not absolutely going to open that can of worms here. We'll stay away from any conversation like that. Not only because it might be controversial, but because it's not what the research backs up. This was an interesting study from 2012, which had a look at the attitudes uh, of, uh, these are university students of males and females towards the study techniques. And you can see that there are distant, the differences that come out. And when they tested these, these are statistically significant differences in the study skills approaches between males and females. So the conclusion of this report says this, the primary conclusion of the study is that contrary to prior research that suggests that females predominantly outperform males in academic student gender alone, such differences can be better explained by mediating variables such as the learning and study strategies. In other words, it's the strategies that the, the males and the females choose independently to use that are actually one of the biggest explanatory factors for the difference in performance. So the authors say this, the debunking of the female stereotype of superior academic performance merely because of gender has pedagogical implications. This matters in our teaching and learning practice in the classroom. Okay, so this brings me to the final part here. It's a practical application. How do we do this? Right. It's very, very simple, actually, because all you've got to do is to take the presentation that I've got so far, which has all of that lovely research, and present that to all of your pupils, particularly to the boys. They'll have a look at that research and go, that certainly makes sense, sir. I'm absolutely going to make sure that I do that. And we, we know that that's exactly not how to do it, because it has been my experience here that the differences in the choices that pupils make on, on revision and self-learning strategies is based less on information and more on motivation. Or, in other words, the Ulster Scots, it's better felt than telt. The students need to experience the benefits of retrieval practice in order to choose to use it when you're not watching. And for this, I'm going to jump into the excellent Education Endowment Foundation report on self-regulated learning, which says this. There may be some benefit to introducing pupils to the general importance of things like planning, of monitoring their work, of evaluating. Whilst that's true, the particular strategies are often quite subject or task specific. And the evidence suggests that they're best taught through subject content. While some of the metacognitive strategies in this guidance can be described generically, they can only be improved through practice. And this means applying them to specific tasks. In other words, what they're basically saying is that if we are trying to help our students to choose wisely when it comes to study techniques, what we need to do is not just inform them through some of those general study skills classes that many of our schools will run. Those are okay. Information is part of it, but information is necessary but not sufficient. What we need to do is to get them to experience the benefit of it. And the best way to do that is not just by a one-off single study skills class, but for us to embed them richly within our classrooms. 
Now, back to this book again, I was cognizant of not wanting to infringe any copyrights um, laws here. So I didn't want to copy and paste in a number of these books, uh, the pages here. So I'm just giving you a sense of the range of different subject specific advice that they have. So generally or genuinely encourage you to get hold of that. But what I want to do is to give you as we finish some a, practical examples from how I do this in the geography classroom. One of the greatest strategies for retrieval practice is the use of flashcards. Uh, flashcards are very useful because they lean absolutely into what the research tells us in terms of how to maximize the benefit of that effortful practice of retrieval practice. Part of the problem is that um, it's the more motivated students that tend to produce the flashcards, um, and it's the less motivated students, the ones that would benefit most from them, who generally don't tend to um, produce them for themselves. So what I thought a couple of years ago that I would try to incorporate my flashcards into the notes that I produce. So I, I am a great advocate of um, these booklets for GCSE pupils in particular, organizes everything together. And you can see here that what I have down the right hand side or what I'm calling tests then check. These are notes with built in flashcards. So one of the very first things that I'll do with the students when they come into us, I teach in a senior high school, it's 14 to 18. So whenever they first join us in year 11, one of the first things that I'll do is to start to introduce them to this notion of retrieval practice. And I will tell them about flashcards. I don't really go into the studies that back it up, to be honest with you. And they're not really that interested in it because my focus is less on the kind of theoretical understanding behind it and more the practical application. I want them to feel it working and to experience it. So they'll be sitting in their pairs. And at the start of, of most of my classes, as we're getting set for what's coming, it'll be something like this. Number one on the right, number two on the left. Number one, I want you to quiz number two on these two pages. And the instruction is that if number two gets stuck, number one does not tell them the answer. Number one gives them a clever clue, which means that both sets of students are thinking at the same time. One of the things that I'll say to them a lot, if you're not thinking, you're probably not learning. And I must say the, one of the greatest um, rewards for me is when I'm saying this in class now, I can, I can actually see some of the students mouthing it back. As I said, they're so used to me saying it. I've drilled it into them to try to get that uh, notion in that, that this is important. Whatever you're doing when you're learning, you have to think. So that's just one really simple example of how I've been trying to build those in. So I'll just finish off now by giving you a couple of uh, quick overviews of the how uh, in terms of what I'm doing to introduce this. The first thing is that I'll try and baseline my students in terms of their study methods and their own sense of their study skills. Uh, are they over or under confident? So what I did here was, this is just a sample from some of my year 11s. I got them to self-assess in terms of how they rated their study skill ability out of five. And I got them then to outline some of the methods that they would use. And I did an interesting little comparison with the CAT scores that we did um, at the start of the year to see if the students that were uh, having higher CAT scores, is that reflected in the choices they're making in terms of exam technique? And what this is going to allow me to do then is to try to identify those students that maybe aren't using the right kind of retrieval practice whenever they're revising, or perhaps a little bit overconfident in their own ability. Practice, 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 then practice some more. And that's what the Education Endowment Foundation report says. This is best delivered within the class setting. And whenever I use it a lot, I can demonstrate to the students, do you see this works? Do you see how useful this is? When you're at home, when you're making your own choices, this is exactly the thing you should do. Periodically monitor your pupils studying and um, maybe you could take a period and just say to them right off you go I'm going to give you um, the whole period and I want you to do some kind of retrieval practice on some part of the book. Walk around monitor try to keep it low stakes but it's going to give you an opportunity to identify those students who are developing those skills well. And finally get the parents and guardians informed um, I over the past uh, six or seven years have revised for GCSEs on three separate occasions. 
and never sat any of them because I'm a parent of daughters who have gone through the education system. And I must admit, whenever I'm trying to study with them on a subject that I'm not as familiar with, I struggle sometimes to know what questions to ask. So what I'm doing with my uh, the parents when I meet them in the parents meetings is talking to them briefly about this, showing them the test then check in the books and saying, look, if you're wanting to help your son or daughter whenever they're revising, this is the way to do it. And you're getting that partnership from home that helps support the whole thing. So that's retrieval practice. For you as teachers, as professionals, it's a little bit of the theory of the understanding of why we should be considering it and using it. But the main emphasis for our pupils is that practical implication or application because retrieval practice is better felt than told. Thank you very much. That's great, Alistair. Thank you very much. Um, I just noticed in the chat, Maeve Kerry has the Irish, I think, for better felt than told. But as I don't have Irish, I don't think I'm, I'm going to attempt to say that um, if there is any speakers on the, on the, in the, the call.